I'm just a mother. I'm just a whatever. We are daughters of the king. And I mean, he's got work for us to do, and we need to be doing it, don't we? And sometimes we're just sitting back saying, I'm, I have no influence at all. Well, you do. While we're raising the next generation, and we, we have a very important job to do. So don't you forget that. And Judges, I think, shows us that with Deborah. Now, our next judge we find in chapter 6, and that's Gideon. Now, you probably know a little bit about Gideon. Probably what you know about him is the fleece. That's probably the thing that you really remember about Gideon. But there was, remember, the 40 years of rest with Deborah. And now, when Gideon comes on the scene, the cycle has repeated itself again. And Gideon uh, has been oppressed with all of the Israelites along with them for seven years. And this, this time is the Midianites. Now these were a gang of folks. They were like bandits in the hills. It was sort of like how we hear about guerrilla warfare today. They would swoop down and take everything the Israelites had. And a lot of times they would wait until they brought in their crop. And as soon as that crop appeared, before it could be harvested, these Midianites would come out of the hills and take it all. And they'd take not only the crops, but also the flocks. And so they were living in caves. They were living in caves like animals. They were scared to death. And the day that Gideon comes on the scene, he's hiding out. He's in the wine press thrashing wheat. Because he knew if he thrashed it in the open, like you generally would do, that the Midianites would see him, and here they'd come. And they'd get it all. So he's hiding there doing that trying to scrape a little food together when the angel of the Lord appears. When you see that term, the angel of the Lord, not an angel of the Lord, but the angel of the Lord, that is the pre-incarnate Jesus Christ. So Jesus appeared to him and called him a valiant warrior. Look with me, if you will, in chapter 6. Verse 12, the angel of the Lord appeared to him and said, The Lord is with you, O valiant warrior. Now, I don't know about you, but the times when God calls me to do things, I feel the least like a valiant warrior that I could possibly feel. There are many times when I am so frightened and I think, Me? Are you talking to me? Surely not. Surely you don't think I can do this. I remember when I was called to be the teaching leader of a very large international Bible study, and I felt so unworthy and so unqualified, and I was so shocked when I was asked to be this. Probably not as shocked as the leadership was when they heard that I was going to be the one, because they were really shocked. But I have never been so scared, and I had a problem like a lot of women have, I would get real emotional. And I still can whip myself up into a really good cry with very little trouble. But I was concerned about that, and God took that away miraculously. Now, that doesn't mean that I still can't come up with a real good cry every now and then, but I don't cry all the time like I did then. And I'm very grateful for that because I had prayed and asked him for years to remove that, and he did. And I'm so thankful. You know, he knows who we are, but he also knows what we can become and that's with his power. So he's not really looking for our ability. He's looking for our availability in order that he might fill us and use us powerfully. Now Gideon brought out his list of excuses. He said, well, I'm the least in my tribe, and I'm the youngest. And he just went on and on like, like he was telling God something he didn't know. And he was saying, if you find this out, it'll probably disqualify me. Don't we do that? How many lists do you drag out to show God when he asks you to do something? You say, well, I'm too young. I don't say that. I'm too old. <laughs> or I'm too busy. Do we ever say that? I'm too inadequate. I'm too unspiritual. I'm too unqualified. Whatever it is, we say we, we don't have time and we can't do it. So, you know, we need to understand that when God calls us, he knows what we're doing, and we're not surprised. Well, he knows what he's doing, and we're not surprising him in any way with our little list that we have. So we need to remember that Gideon had doubts. Of course he did. He had doubts, don't we? We bring them to God, and God did 
answer his doubts. Remember, that's the story of the fleece when he said, if you'd make it wet one time and dry another time, that's another wonderful story, and God did that for him. But when we bring out our list, we're saying that God is not able to do what he's asked us to do, and he's fully able to do that. What you want is a teachable spirit and a willingness to do it, and that's what happened here. And you know, Gideon was used in a mighty way. God took him on a miraculous journey. He had him gather an army of 36,000 men, and he whittled them down to 300. And you remember how they surrounded the enemy with torches and shouts and trumpets, and they routed that enemy, and they had the victory. I wish I could say that Gideon ended really well, but he didn't. He got a little prideful. And he decided that he was doing pretty good. You know, that happens to us sometimes. When we have victory in our life, we think we're doing great and we give ourselves the credit for it. And we don't need God anymore. So Gideon sort of went out on his own. Even so, though, God let the land be restful and peaceful for another 40 years, which was a wonderful thing to see. Sometimes we move away from God, don't we, when we've had a victory in our life. It's a warning for us to stay close to him and to continue to serve him all the days of our life, not just when we have these great victories and then move out on our own. I heard a story about a, a person who was in a car, to a couple that was in a car, and she said to her husband, he's driving along, and she says to him, you know, honey, we just aren't as close as we used to be. We, um, we used to sit really close in the car. We sat... I just sat so close to him. We were just all scrunched up together and so romantic, and we don't do that anymore. And as only a man could say this, he drives and says, well, I haven't moved. <laughs> so that's a good lesson for us. God is not the one who moves. It's us. We're the ones who move. And then we see um, in chapter uh, 13 through 16, we move over to Samson. Now, you probably remember Samson as the strong guy. One thing that Israel never seemed to learn from history is that you, that you don't learn from history. And so Israel didn't learn, and neither do we. That was rebellion, and there was oppression, and all the repeat again. And then uh, God sent a judge. Now, Israel cried out for a deliverer after this uh, 40 years of oppression by the Philistines this time. We find that in chapter 13, verse 1. So after Gideon, there were six judges before Samson came on the scene. And Samson's probably the most memorable. But Samson was a whole lot like John the Baptist in that he was dedicated from birth. Uh, he, had, he was the, the son of parents who were barren and wanted a child so bad. And an angel came and proclaimed uh, his birth. And so he was raised and instructed by godly parents. They did everything I'm sure they could possibly do. And it was really... A wonderful thing. He was blessed with great strength, but he misused his strength. He misused his blessings. He was a physically very strong, but spiritually very weak. He had a weakness toward women. He was forever getting himself in trouble with women. They would betray him, and he would do it all over again. And so we find Samson lost his strength, and he was unable to perform what God had asked him to do because he made wrong choices. They were his choices, not God's choices. He used his God-given strength for ungodly things. He went outside the boundary of what God said he could do, and he got himself in trouble. And then he met a woman called Delilah, and she was his undoing. And Delilah found out the secret to his strength, and she used it against him, and he was captured his eyes were gouged out. He was made sport of by the enemy. But it has a wonderful ending to that story because even though this happened, God used him in a mighty way. God used Samson at the very end because Samson cried out to God and said, Give me my one last desire, Lord. Let me bring these people down. And so, unbeknownst to them, his strength was coming back and he was able to pull down the building that they were inside of, and all of them died. What this says that's so marvelous, I believe, is that God is always willing to forgive, and that it's never too late. As long as we have life, it's never too late. 
and we could cry out. And you may be thinking today, oh, God will never forgive me for the things that I've done. I've just done so much you don't have a, a clue. But the truth is he will. He always is listening for our cry. And so when we cry out to him, he is a forgiving God. There's no end to his forgiveness. If you have failed him in some way, you need to admit it and then get up and get busy because he may have someone for you to encourage with your failure and possibly even your own children. We need to admit this to our own children sometimes. You know, we need to just ask him. There's stumbling blocks in our life like Samson had. We need to be aware of that and stay away from it. And then the third division that we're looking at today is the consequences of failure, and that's in chapter 17 through 21. This is a hard read, ladies. It really is. This is a, a, a sad time. This is when there was no king in Israel, and every man did what was right in his own eyes. Wicked behavior shows the depravity of mankind without God. But it's about people who decided to take matters in their own hands and do what was right in their own eyes. Now, it sounds a little familiar, doesn't it? A lot like picking up today's newspaper or looking at the television. Now, I want to close with a principle that is so true because we have such a responsibility as women, and that is that godliness of the previous generation does not guarantee godliness of the present one. So we as wives and mothers with a great deal of influence need to get busy doing whatever we need to do to see that we don't forget who God is and what he's done.